Section fifty two of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section fifty two to sir watkin phillips baronet of jesus college oxford dear phillips in my last i treated you with a high flavoured dish in the character of the scotch lieutenant and i must present him once more for your entertainment it was our fortune to feed upon him the best part of three days and i do not doubt that he will start again in our way before we shall have finished our northern excursion the day after our meeting with him at durham proved so tempestuous that we did not choose to proceed on our journey and my uncle persuaded him to stay till the weather should clear up giving him at the same time a general invitation to our mess the man has certainly gathered a whole budget of shrewd observations, but he brings them forth in such an ungracious manner as would be extremely disgusting if it was not marked by that characteristic oddity which never fails to attract the attention. He and Mr. Bramble discoursed, and even disputed, on different subjects in war, policy, the belles lettres law and metaphysics and sometimes they were warmed into such altercation as seemed to threaten an abrupt dissolution of their society but mr bramble set a guard over his own irascibility the more vigilantly as the officer was his guest and when in spite of all his efforts he began to wax warm the other prudently cooled in the same proportion Mistress Tabitha, chancing to accost her brother by the familiar diminutive of Matt, "'Pray, sir,' said the lieutenant, "'is your name Matthias?' "'You must know that it is one of our uncle's foibles to be ashamed of his name, Matthew, because it is puritanical.' And this question chagrined him so much that he answered, "'No, by God!' in a very abrupt tone of displeasure. The Scot took umbrage at the manner of his reply, and bristling up, "'If I had known,' said he, "'that you did not care to tell your name, I should not have asked the question. The lady called you Matt, and I naturally thought it was Matthias. Perhaps it may be Methuselah, or Metrodorus, or Metellus, or Mathurinus, or Malthinus, or Matamorus or no cried my uncle laughing it is neither of those captain my name is matthew bramble at your service the truth is i have a foolish peak at the name of matthew because it favours of those canting hypocrites who in cromwell's time christened all their children by names taken from the scripture a foolish peak indeed cried mistress tabby and even sinful to fall out with your name because it is taken from holy writ i would have you to know you was called after great uncle matthew ap maddock ap meredith esq of llanwistin in montgomeryshire justice of the quorum and crusty rattleorum a gentleman of great worth and property descended in a straight line by the female side from llewellyn prince of wales this genealogical anecdote seemed to make some impression upon the north briton who bowed very low to the descendant of llewellyn and observed that he himself had the honour of a scriptural nomination the lady expressing a desire of knowing his address he said he designed himself lieutenant obadiah lismahago and in order to assist her memory he presented her with a slip of paper inscribed with these three words which she repeated with great emphasis 
declaring it was one of the most noble and sonorous names she had ever heard. He observed that Obadiah was an adventitious appellation, derived from his great-grandfather, who had been one of the original Covenanters. But Lismahago was the family surname, taken from a place in Scotland so called. He likewise dropped some hints about the antiquity of his pedigree, adding with a smile of self-denial, Sed genus et proavus, et quae non fecimus ipsi, vix ea nostra voco, which quotation he explained in deference to the ladies. And Mistress Tabitha did not fail to compliment him on his modesty in waiving the merit of his ancestry, adding that it was the less necessary to him as he had such a considerable fund of his own. She now began to glue herself to his favour with the grossest adulation. She expatiated upon the antiquity and virtues of the Scottish nation, upon their valour, probity, learning, and politeness. She even descended to encomiums on his own personal address, his gallantry, good sense, and erudition. She appealed to her brother whether the captain was not the very image of our cousin Governor Griffith. She discovered a surprising eagerness to know the particulars of his life, and asked a thousand questions concerning his achievements in war, all which Mr. Lismahago answered with a sort of Jesuitical reserve, affecting a reluctance to satisfy her curiosity on a subject that concerned his own exploits. By dint of her interrogations, however, we learned that he and Ensign Murphy had made their escape from the French hospital at Montreal, and taken to the woods in hope of reaching some English settlement. But mistaking their route, they fell in with a party of Miamis, who carried them away in captivity. The intention of these Indians was to give one of them as an adopted son to a venerable Sachem, who had lost his own in the course of the war, and to sacrifice the other according to the custom of the country. Murphy, as being the younger and handsomer of the two, was designed to fill the place of the deceased, not only as the son of the Sachem, but as the spouse of a beautiful squaw, to whom his predecessor had been betrothed. But in passing through the different wigwams or villages of the Miamis, poor Murphy was so mangled by the women and children who have the privilege of torturing all prisoners in their passage, that by the time they arrived at the place of the Sachem's residence, he was rendered altogether unfit for the purposes of marriage. It was determined, therefore, in the assembly of the warriors, that Ensign Murphy should be brought to the stake, and that the lady should be given to Lieutenant Lismahago, who had likewise received his share of torments, though they had not produced emasculation. A joint of one finger had been cut, or rather sawed off with a rusty knife. One of his great toes was crushed into a mash betwixt two stones. Some of his teeth were drawn, or dug out with a crooked nail. Splintered reeds had been thrust up his nostrils and other tender parts, and the calves of his legs had been blown up with mines of gunpowder dug in the flesh with the sharp point of the tomahawk. The Indians themselves allowed that Murphy died with great heroism, singing as his death-song the Drimmen Do, in concert with Mr. Lismahago, who was present at the solemnity. After the warriors and the matrons had made a hearty meal upon the muscular flesh which they pared from the victim, and had applied a great variety of tortures, which he bore without flinching. An old lady with a sharp knife scooped out one of his eyes, and put a burning coal in the socket. The pain of this operation was so exquisite that he could not help bellowing, upon which the audience raised a shout of exultation, and one of the warriors stealing behind him 
gave him the coup de grace with a hatchet lismahago's bride the squaw squinkinacusta distinguished herself on this occasion she showed a great superiority of genius in the tortures which she contrived and executed with her own hands she vied with the stoutest warrior in eating the flesh of the sacrifice and after all the other females were fuddled with dram drinking she was not so intoxicated but that she was able to play the game of the platter with the conjuring sachem and afterwards go through the ceremony of her own wedding which was consummated that same evening the captain had lived very happily with this accomplished squaw for two years during which she bore him a son who is now the representative of his mother's tribe but at length to his unspeakable grief she had died of a fever occasioned by eating too much raw bear which they had killed in a hunting excursion by this time mr lismahago was elected sachem acknowledged first warrior of the badger tribe and dignified with the name or epithet of okaka nasta ogarora which signifies nimble as a weasel but all these advantages and honours he was obliged to resign in consequence of being exchanged for the orator of the community who had been taken prisoner by the indians that were in alliance with the english at the peace he had sold out upon half pay and was returned to britain with a view to pass the rest of his life in his own country where he hoped to find some retreat where his slender finances would afford him a decent subsistence such are the outlines of mr lismahago's history to which tabitha did seriously incline her ear indeed she seemed to be taken with the same charms that captivated the heart of desdemona who loved the more for the dangers he had passed the description of poor murphy's sufferings which threw my sister liddy into a swoon extracted some sighs from the breast of mistress tabby when she understood that he had been rendered unfit for marriage she began to spit and ejaculated jesus what cruel barbarians and she made wry faces at the lady's nuptial repast but she was eagerly curious to know the particulars of her marriage dress whether she wore high-breasted stays or bodice a robe of silk or velvet and laces of mechlin or mignonette she supposed as they were connected with the french she used rouge and had her hair dressed in the parisian fashion the captain would have declined giving a categorical explanation of all these particulars observing in general that the indians were too tenacious of their own customs to adopt the modes of any nation whatsoever he said moreover that neither the simplicity of their manners nor the commerce of their country would admit of these articles of luxury which are deemed magnificence in europe and that they were too virtuous and sensible to encourage the introduction of any fashion which might help to render them corrupt and effeminate these observations served only to inflame her desire of knowing the particulars about which she had inquired and with all his evasion he could not help discovering the following circumstances that his princess had neither shoes stockings shift nor any kind of linen that her bridal dress consisted of a petticoat of red baize and a fringed blanket fastened about her shoulders with a copper skewer but of ornaments she had great plenty her hair was curiously plaited and interwoven with bobbins of human bone one eyelid was painted green and the other yellow her cheeks were blue the lips white the teeth red and there was a black list drawn down the middle of the forehead as far as the tip of the nose a couple of gaudy parrot's feathers were stuck through the division of the nostrils there was a blue stone set in the chin 
her earrings consisted of two pieces of hickory of the size and shape of drumsticks her arms and legs were adorned with bracelets of wampum her breast glittered with numerous strings of glass beads she wore a curious pouch a pocket of woven grass elegantly painted with various colours about her neck was hung the fresh scalp of a mohawk warrior whom her deceased lover had lately slain in battle and finally she was anointed from head to foot with bear's grease which sent forth a most agreeable odour one would imagine that these paraphernalia would not have been much admired by a modern fine lady but mistress tabitha was resolved to approve of all of the captain's connections she wished indeed the squaw had been better provided with linen but she owned there was much taste and fancy in her ornaments she made no doubt therefore that madame squinkinacusta was a young lady of good sense and rare accomplishments and a good christian at bottom then she asked whether his consort had been high church or low church presbyterian or anabaptist or had been favoured with any glimmering of the new light of the gospel when he confessed that she and her whole nation were utter strangers to the christian faith she gazed at him with signs of astonishment and humphrey clinker who chanced to be in the room uttered a hollow groan after some pause in the name of god captain lismahago cried she what religion do they profess as to religion madam answered the lieutenant it is among those indians a matter of great simplicity they never heard of any alliance between church and state they in general worship two contending principles one the fountain of all good the other the source of all evil the common people there as in other countries run into the absurdities of superstition but sensible men pay adoration to a supreme being who created and sustains the universe oh what pity exclaimed the pious tabby that some holy man has not been inspired to go and convert these poor heathens the lieutenant told her that while he resided among them two french missionaries arrived in order to convert them to the catholic religion but when they talked of mysteries and revelations which they could neither explain nor authenticate and called in the evidence of miracles which they believed upon hearsay when they taught that the supreme creator of heaven and earth had allowed his only son his own equal in power and glory to enter the bowels of a woman to be born as a human creature to be insulted flagellated and even executed as a malefactor when they pretended to create god himself to swallow digest revive and multiply him at infinitum by the help of a little flour and water the indians were shocked at the impiety of their presumption they were examined by the assembly of the sachems who desired them to prove the divinity of their mission by some miracle they answered that it was not in their power if you were really sent by heaven for our conversion said one of the sachems you would certainly have some supernatural endowments at least you would have the gift of tongues in order to explain your doctrine to the different nations among which you are employed but you are so ignorant of our language that you cannot express yourself even on the most trifling subjects in a word the assembly were convinced of their being cheats and even suspected them of being spies they ordered them a bag of indian corn apiece and appointed a guide to conduct them to the frontiers but the missionaries having more zeal than discretion refused to quit the vineyard they persisted in saying mass 
in preaching baptizing and squabbling with the conjurers or priests of the country till they had thrown the whole community into confusion then the assembly proceeded to try them as impious impostors who represented the almighty as a trifling weak capricious being and pretended to make unmake and reproduce him at pleasure they were therefore convicted of blasphemy and sedition and condemned to the stake where they died singing salve regina in a rapture of joy for the crown of martyrdom which they had thus obtained in the course of this conversation lieutenant lismahago dropped some hints by which it appeared he himself was a free thinker our aunt seemed to be startled at certain sarcasms he threw out against the creed of saint athanasius he dwelt much upon the words reason philosophy and contradiction in terms he bid defiance to the eternity of hell-fire and even threw such squibs at the immortality of the soul as singed a little the whiskers of mistress tabitha's faith for by this time she began to look upon lismahago as a prodigy of learning and sagacity in short he could be no longer insensible to the advances she made towards his affection and although there was something repulsive in his nature he overcame it so far as to make some return to her civilities perhaps he thought it would be no bad scheme in a superannuated lieutenant on half pay to effect a conjunction with an old maid who in all probability had fortune enough to keep him easy and comfortable in the fag-end of his days an ogling correspondence forthwith commenced between this amiable pair of originals he began to sweeten the natural acidity of his discourse with the treacle of compliment and commendation he from time to time offered her snuff of which he himself took great quantities and even made her a present of a purse of silk grass woven by the hands of the amiable squinkinacusta who had used it as a shot pouch in her hunting expeditions from doncaster northwards all the windows of all the inns are scrawled with doggerel rhymes in abuse of the scotch nation and what surprised me very much i did not perceive one line written in the way of recrimination curious to hear what lismahago would say on this subject i pointed out to him a very scurrilous epigram against his countrymen which was engraved on one of the windows of the parlour where we sat he read it with the most starched composure and when i asked his opinion of the poetry it is very terse and very poignant said he but with the help of a wet dishclout it might be rendered more clear and perspicuous i marvel much that some modern wit has not published a collection of these essays under the title of the glazier's triumph over sarney the scot i'm persuaded it would be a very agreeable offering to the patriots of london and westminster when i expressed some surprise that the natives of scotland who travel this way had not broke all the windows upon the road with submission replied the lieutenant that were but shallow policy it would only serve to make the satire more cutting and severe and i think it is much better to let it stand in the window than have it presented in the reckoning my uncle's jaws began to quiver with indignation he said the scribblers of such infamous stuff deserved to be scourged at the cart's tail for disgracing their country with such monuments of malice and stupidity these vermin said he do not consider that they are affording their fellow subjects whom they abuse continual matter of self-gratulation as well as the means of executing the most manly vengeance that can be taken for such low illiberal attacks for my part i admire the philosophic forbearance of the scots 
as much as i despise the insolence of those wretched libellers which is akin to the arrogance of the village cock who never crows but upon his own dunghill the captain with an affectation of candour observed that men of illiberal minds were produced in every soil and that in supposing those were the sentiments of the english in general he should pay too great a compliment to his own country which was not of consequence enough to attract the envy of such a flourishing and powerful people mistress tabby broke forth again in praise of his moderation and declared that scotland was the soil which produced every virtue under heaven when lismahago took his leave for the night she asked her brother if the captain were not the prettiest gentleman he had ever seen and whether there was not something wonderfully engaging in his aspect mr bramble having eyed her some time in silence sister said he the lieutenant is for aught i know an honest man and a good officer he has a considerable share of understanding and a title to more encouragement than he seems to have met with in life but i cannot with a safe conscience affirm that he is the prettiest gentleman i ever saw neither can i discern any engaging charm in his countenance which i vow to god is on the contrary very hard favoured and forbidding i have endeavoured to ingratiate myself with this north briton who is really a curiosity but he has been very shy of my conversation ever since i laughed at his asserting that the english tongue was spoke with more propriety at edinburgh than at london looking at me with a double squeeze of souring in his aspect if the old definition be true said he that risibility is the distinguishing characteristic of a rational creature the english are the most distinguished for rationality of any people i ever knew i owned that the english were easily struck with anything that appeared ludicrous and apt to laugh accordingly but it did not follow that because they were more given to laughter they had more rationality than their neighbours i said such an inference would be an injury to the scots who were by no means defective in rationality though generally supposed little subject to the impressions of humour the captain answered that this supposition must have been deduced either from their conversation or their compositions of which the english could not possibly judge with precision as they did not understand the dialect used by the scots in common discourse as well as in their works of humour when i desired to know what those works of humour were he mentioned a considerable number of pieces which he insisted were equal in point of humour to anything extant in any language dead or living he in particular recommended a collection of detached poems in two small volumes entitled the evergreen and the works of alan ramsay whom i intend to provide myself with at edinburgh he observed that a north briton is seen to a disadvantage in an english company because he speaks in a dialect that they can't relish and in a phraseology which they don't understand he therefore finds himself under a restraint which is a great enemy to wit and humour these are faculties which never appear in full lustre but when the mind is perfectly at ease and as an excellent writer says enjoys her elbow-room he proceeded to explain his assertion that the english language was spoken with greater propriety at edinburgh than in london he said what we generally called the scottish dialect was in fact true genuine old english with a mixture of some french terms and idioms adopted in a long intercourse betwixt the french and scottish nations that the modern english from affectation and false refinement had weakened and even corrupted their language by throwing out the guttural sounds altering the pronunciation and the quantity 
and disusing many words and terms of great significance in consequence of these innovations the works of our best poets such as chaucer spencer and even shakespeare were become in many parts unintelligible to the natives of south britain whereas the scots who retain the ancient language understand them without the help of a glossary for instance said he how have your commentators been puzzled by the following expression in the tempest he's gentle and not fearful as if it was a paralogism to say that being gentle he must of course be courageous but the truth is one of the original meanings if not the sole meaning of that word was noble high-minded and to this day a scotch woman in the situation of the young lady in the tempest would express herself nearly in the same terms don't provoke him for being gentle that is high-spirited he won't tamely bear an insult spencer in the very first stanza of his fairy queen says a gentle knight was pricking on the plain which knight far from being tame and fearful was so stout that nothing did he dread but ever was he dread. to prove that we had impaired the energy of our language by false refinement he mentioned the following words which though widely different in signification are pronounced exactly in the same manner right w r i g h t right w r i t e right r i g h t right r i t e but among the scots these words are as different in pronunciation as they are in meaning and orthography and this is the case with many others which he mentioned by way of illustration he moreover took notice that we had for what reason he could never learn altered the sound of our vowels from that which is retained by all the nations in europe an alteration which rendered the language extremely difficult to foreigners and made it almost impracticable to lay down general rules for orthography and pronunciation besides the vowels were no longer simple sounds in the mouth of an englishman who pronounced both i and u as diphthongs finally he affirmed that we mumbled our speech with our lips and teeth and ran the words together without pause or distinction in such a manner that a foreigner though he understood english tolerably well was often obliged to have recourse to a scotchman to explain what a native of england had said in his own language the truth of this remark was confirmed by mr bramble from his own experience but he accounted for it on another principle he said the same observation would hold in all languages that a swiss talking french was more easily understood than a parisian by a foreigner who had not made himself master of the language because every language had its peculiar recitative and it would always require more pains attention and practice to acquire both the words and the music than to learn the words only and yet nobody would deny that the one was imperfect without the other he therefore apprehended that the scotchman and the swiss were better understood by learners because they spoke the words only without the music which they could not rehearse one would imagine this check might have damped the north briton but it served only to agitate his humour for disputation he said if every nation had its own recitative or music the scots had theirs and the scotsman who had not yet acquired the cadence of the english would naturally use his own in speaking their language therefore if he was better understood than the native his recitative must be more intelligible than that of the english of consequence the dialect of the scots had an advantage over that of their fellow-subjects 
and this was another strong presumption that the modern english had corrupted their language in the article of pronunciation the lieutenant was by this time become so polemical that every time he opened his mouth out flew a paradox which he maintained with all the enthusiasm of altercation but all his paradoxes favoured strong of a partiality for his own country he undertook to prove that poverty was a blessing to a nation that oatmeal was preferable to wheat flour and that the worship of cloacina in temples which admitted both sexes and every rank of votaries promiscuously was a filthy species of idolatry that outraged every idea of delicacy and decorum i did not so much wonder at his broaching these doctrines as at the arguments equally whimsical and ingenious which he adduced in support of them in fine lieutenant lismahago is a curiosity which i have not yet sufficiently perused and therefore i shall be sorry when we lose his company though god knows there is nothing very amiable in his manner or disposition as he goes directly to the south-west division of scotland and we proceed in the road to berwick we shall part to-morrow at a place called felton bridge and i dare say this separation will be very grievous to our aunt mistress tabitha unless she has received some flattering assurance of his meeting her again if i fail in my purpose of entertaining you with these unimportant occurrences they will at least serve as exercises of patience for which you are indebted to yours always j melford morpeth july thirteenth end of section fifty two